Thanks, Prince. Thanks, Jing. Uh, first of all, happy Father's Day to everybody. I've got my Father's Day socks with my daughter on them. <laughs> Lots of new dads during the pandemic, right? <laughs> cool. Um, today I'm going to talk about egocentric scene understanding, but really we form this internally as a problem that we call indexing. So let me kind of define what that actually is a bit more clearly. Um, and what it means to build a real world object index. So one of the key aspects of egocentric machine perception is that the user is embodied in their environment. So basically we capture all of their interactions with the environment through all of our different sensors. So this makes scene understanding a really, really critical function of what we want to enable for our future AR headsets. We want to be able to understand the environment in a way that allows us to create an index over it. And doing so would allow us to sort, search, query that index. So we want to be able to do that so that we can get information about an object's state over time, their semantics, and the interactions of humans with objects. So let's take this chair in my home office for an example. There's a lot of questions that you can ask about this chair. Right? General information about what make and model is it, uh, particular information about when was it last cleaned, <laughs> things which are very specific to this chair. Right? Um, and for egocentric data with Project ARIA, we really care about the object state over time, because egocentric data provides this continuous capture mode. Uh, so we observe this particular object over a long period of time with many observations. And those observations are grounded in 3D. We ultimately you know, want to do more than just 2D object detection. We want to enable indexing actually for any object that you might encounter. So before I talk about our specific research projects on indexing, I'm going to use a, a little bit of time to go over the last 20 years or so of scene understanding research through this lens of indexing. So you have a full context of really where we're at today. Taking a little bit of a robotics perspective here, the embodied scene understanding problem really had its roots in answering first the question of localization of the device in the environment. If we know where we are, we can start to reason about the environment as we move through it, and even persist information over time. Monoslam and others were some of the first methods that really brought this real-time, unconstrained ability to track where a device is with respect to its environment. And Jing told you a lot about all of the details and projects that we're still engaging in to really fully solve this problem for egocentric data. But after we can localize where we are, it's pretty natural to form the problem of scene understanding as being able to explain all of the data around you that was observed by the sensors. So being able to explain every pixel is pretty invaluable you know, towards explaining the scene. Um, and we saw an explosion of dense reconstruction techniques that include dense slam, semi-dense slam, RGBD slam, and fusion of these representations into complete 3D scenes, such as with Connect Fusion shown here. All of these were based on the idea that you can optimize the parameters of your scene representation just by minimizing the total error when you render your model of the scene back. And this includes object-based slam methods, like slam++, which require predefined 3D object models so basically, if you know how to render the objects and your objects compose the scene, then you can optimize for the scene parameters and the camera parameters appropriately. Today, we actually do a really good job of capturing dense reconstruction and dynamic correspondences, even from just RGB alone. The Nerf explosion over the past few years has created a lot of new tools to be able to capture the 3D and 4D extent of the scene with remarkable precision. This includes our own work shown here, which is going to be presented at CVPR on dynamic 3D videos using Nerf-like technology. But the clear drawbacks to these methods with respect to indexing is that you have a limited ability to query this model for any of the semantic information that you might find interesting in the scene. Um, because of the bottom-up nature that we're modeling the data, right? explaining the data alone is not quite enough. So this doesn't really solve the full indexing problem to our desire. We still need a way to query that scene representation to get information about the state of objects and entities within the scene. So revisiting our goal of indexing, we can now define it as detecting and tracking any entity through space and time. And when I say entity, I mean anything that's been defined previously as a semantic object, like you know, the categories in MS Coco, uh, or anything that's been defined by a user as an object. So this latter point is really important for egocentric data. It's really important for egocentric data because there's numerous objects that we encounter every day in our life that just aren't, you can't put a category label to them, right? And the value of allowing user-defined objects is something that fundamentally separates egocentric uh, machine perception from other domains like autonomous driving, where the list of, of objects you might want to index 
are, are relatively finite and they're very well defined. You know, there's stop signs, lane markers, pedestrians, that kind of thing. So I'll give a quick overview of some of our research projects that we're working on to enable scene understanding and indexing using Project ARIA. We currently have three different streams that we're kind of working towards. The first is detecting and tracking known objects from a known taxonomy. So if you already know ahead of time the category of objects you want to detect or the exact things that you want to detect. The second is focusing on novel introduction of objects that can be detected and tracked using Project ARIA. And finally, I'll touch, touch on our work to leverage natural language to detect objects in the real world without having to predefine what you want to detect and track. So getting more towards open world indexing. The first approach I mentioned is detecting and tracking objects from a known set of classes or categories. In essence, we're limiting our understanding of the world to this predefined set of categories. And uh, you, know, you can think of this as the list of objects from ScanNet or Coco or pick your favorite ML data set. As you might expect, we can leverage the image object detectors to aid, detectors to aid the detection process. And then we're able to use multi-view geometry to track the objects in 3D over time because we have these great multi-view sensors and we have great poses coming from SLAM on Project ARIA. On the right, you'll see the view of, from a Project ARIA headset of us detecting objects and instantiating them in 3D as we observe them over time. On the left, you'll see a top-down view of the scene where the red uh, the red boxes are the ground truth of the object 3D bounding boxes, and the blue are our estimates over time, which can, you can see do pretty well, especially with more observations and from more, more vantage points. As I mentioned, this technique uses predefined knowledge of which objects appear in this room. We know every single object that will appear in this room. So this is actually great for research, right? It gives us a very measurable way to test our detectors. You know, we have perfect knowledge here of what we should be able to detect. And it actually allows us to focus on tracking very deeply. But this use case misses a very important category of objects that we encounter all the time that I mentioned before in egocentric data. Novel objects that don't have a 3D model already or don't fit into an object category, such as this gift my daughter made me for Father's Day. Egocentric data is able to uniquely capture our constant interaction with objects in the environment. It's exceptionally natural for us to be picking things up, investigating them, and really planning or understanding how we might use objects, even for objects that we're familiar with. This manual inspection is part of our everyday process. So that brings us to our second project where we're trying to allow the user to define this is an object that I care about using their Project ARIA device. We call this novel object introduction. In this video, you'll see our real-time system for introducing novel objects using a Project ARIA device. The user simply draws a bounding box around the object of interest and as long as the appearance remains relatively consistent, we're able to track the objects successfully, even through changes such as drinking from the glass of water that you just saw, and later in the video, peeling and even taking a bite from the banana. This is hugely important for our research ecosystem. We've now started to close the loop between users and objects. So any researcher with a Project ARIA device can use the system to introduce novel objects that they might care about detecting, tracking, or knowing the state of. The ability to track these manually introduced objects so well allows us to track them in 3D even under dynamic motion. In this video, you'll see again, a user is drawing, a researcher is drawing a quick annotation in each of the stereo cameras on our Project ARIA, which allow us to get a rough sense of where this thing is in 3D. And even as he picks up the mug, moves it around, you'll see our tracking is pretty stable under this dynamic motion. So lastly, I'll talk about our taxonomy-free object discovery using large language models. The specific goal of this project is to allow open world detection through leveraging natural language as opposed to predefining the set of categories or predefining your sort of world model of objects ahead of time. Language has already been shown to be super rich at, at capturing the semantic information over the past few years from work being done at Meta, Google, OpenAI, DeepMind, and basically every other company. To do this, we're using the vision language model CLIP from OpenAI. This large-scale model was trained using 400 million text image pairs that were sourced and cleaned from the internet using their images and text captions. So this provides a massive, diverse, very rich data set for learning image language alignment. And the CLIP model has pretty amazing complexity that's been captured within it. Once you have this model that allows you to encode text and images, you can really easily create a zero-shot classifier all you have to do is compute the feature distance dot product, 
between your image embedding and your text label embeddings. For our use case, the text labels are just the objects that we care about in the world. The amazing part about this model is that it's already been pre-trained with so much data that you can easily change the set of classes at runtime. You simply provide a new set of text labels of the objects that you'd want to detect. While sifting, or sorry, in this video you see a clip-based object detection model running on ARIA. Uh, while the user's sifting through uh, the objects in their kid's playroom, they're narrating out loud, right, using their human voice, <laughs> what exactly they're searching for. The speech is extracted from the audio narration, and the user's gaze, which you see in the green dot here, is used as a spatial prior for the object detection. We just try to detect the objects that the user's already spoken about. So notice how the model is able to segment out objects and give them the appropriate natural language label. This all happens without a predefined set of objects that we're looking for ahead of time. It's all updated by the user on the fly. We're really just getting started with this research. Project Aria provides a pretty amazing research vehicle to go out and understand what egocentric data actually looks like. So that all of this data in its diversity and scale is going to be essential for solving the scene indexing and object indexing problems. So that at some point you'll be able to go anywhere and detect and track any object regardless of where you might take it or where it moves to. So thanks very much. That's it for my talk. And then I'll take questions. Hi. Um, so I, I, I remember playing with Clip a little bit. And I remember also feeling that it was kind of like uh, finicky. So I imagine in different lighting conditions and different angles, certain things you know, might not actually look like the canonical set of you know, objects you find in the data set that, that it's trained on. So I was just wondering, how do you, first of all, how do you, how do you decide where the object is? And do you augment it in any way to kind of like align it well with the text description? Yeah, so as mentioned, we, we do, for some of our research, use the eye gaze as a bit of a prior, right? It's not always the case you're looking at the objects that you care about, but with you know, the kind of the random scatter scanning that you do with your eyes, it's pretty likely that you're going to look at objects which are worth detecting, so to speak. Uh, now, to your other point about you know, how finicky is this model, this is a really, really great point. Anybody who's not played around with these large language models or with Clip, uh, I definitely recommend you know, go try the, the open source versions of them at least. And you'll see yourself that it's not as straightforward as saying you know, just the object is one word and then everything just works. So there absolutely is a bit of prompt engineering that goes into this. You know, for lighting, like you mentioned, it might be a, a dark photo of object name is the better prompt that helps you detect with higher recall. Um, what we found was often for these egocentric videos, because uh, the, the objects can be quite small at times, is that if you prompt engineer a little bit and put a blurry photo of the object, that that sometimes can actually help improve your detection performance. So the reason why this works is because of the concatenation properties of language. Right? You compose those words, those tokens together. So you go from you know, my object to a small version of my object or a low light version of my object. Um, and you can do that really easily, right? That's something that the category-based methods just they don't have the flexibility for. You, you can't you know, have a, a low light version of a, a car or something in your detector in that form. Um, one other question actually was in the demos I saw that you added like some sort of like mask on top of the object, right? Within the bounding boxes. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was just purely from like the entity detection within the bounding box like separate from clip, or was that like some sort of saliency that you calculated with respect to the clip gradients? So no extra work was done to show that. It's basically just the attention of the, the query prompt within the, the kind of uh, patch you know, that, that was highlighted. Uh, so we use that to, to, for our own research, right, to gauge how well is this really detecting? Is it thinking that things that are next to the object we care about are part of the object, right, to guide some of our prompt engineering and other refinements like adding the eye tracking as the prior and whatnot. Got it. So it's mostly from the visual attention in the vision encoder itself? Yeah. OK, cool. All right, thank you. Yeah, great questions. Thanks. Any other questions? These are two questions. So on the first slide, you had uh, whether my wallet is on the chair or not. So was it? <laughs> uh, in that picture, no. But often, I find, especially if I'm wearing athletic shorts, my wallet will fall out all over the place. <laughs> so that's good to know. And then the other one was the object tra tracking, the novel object tracking. So do you build the model for it on device itself, or do you ship it somewhere and download a model? 
So we don't build the model for it our, ourselves on the device. Um, you might have seen in the video these little sort of templates, 2D template patches accumulating. So that's kind of our, you know, for, for our research demo, that's kind of our accumulated object model. It's like the set of all of these patches that we've tracked throughout the sequence sort of form our representation of what, what we should be looking for in the next frames for the, model, or for the object. OK. So you're not building a, like a 3D model of it? Uh, we're, we, do, we do have some 3D tracking, but we're not trying to build like a 3D CAD model of that sort, uh, you know, a dense reconstruction. I think that's kind of more of our, our future work. But we're really focused on the, the tracking of novel objects, um, especially because, you know, I, met, I had up on the slide, like, what is an object is a very fundamental question. You know, tracking a part of an object versus the whole object, you know, that, that has some utility as well. OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah, OK, one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so for, for indexing, like, I guess one part of it is, is like, what are the objects inside the scene? But also, if you have, like, you know, sets of chairs around a table, right, there might be four of them. And you want to give them names, right? Like, you want to give them unique identities. And so, like, a question I had was, when you think about indexing, like, do you also think about the physical positions they are with respect to unique entities within the scene so that you can say, the chair on the left of the, or closer to the door or, or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a very uh, key problem for what we believe is necessary in indexing is that the 3D, the spatial state of the object is really, really important, not just in terms of being able to query it, the history of the object, right? Not all objects are rigid. They might have dynamic properties and the human might be manipulating them and turn it into something different. But also there's tons of scenarios where you have multiple objects that look really similar and appearance alone is not enough to track through those sort of sequences. So it's much better we found to have at least some version of 3D representation, whether it's kind of a center of mass or 3D bounding box, a full object model, like dense reconstruction. All of those kind of enhance your ability to predict the tracking for, for your objects in the next frames.